Uh, greetings, uh, my name is Wayne Davis, and the topic of this presentation is the communion of the Lord's Supper. Scriptures will be taken from 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 34. Many of us, uh, of us have heard those read many times uh, as the church is partaking of the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul explained the communion aspect in the worship of the Lord's Supper for Christians in the 1 Corinthians 10th chapter, 14 to 21. Now, he did this to help the church members understand the reality of demons in idolatry. The historical context of physical Israel uh, being the partakers of the order in 1018 was also used as an example of communion in any type of worship. And so there was then a the idea that an idol was nothing. That's what they uh, were talking about to the Corinthian church. The eating of this meal uh, that had been sacrificed to an idol was nothing. However, when that one was eating that meal within a communion with that idol, then the demon entered into the picture. And so he used that setting then uh, for the church could understand perhaps better than what he actually had talked about, the remembrance that Jesus called forth. We bring all of that in. In 1 Corinthians then 11, 17 through 26, a story about a faction that caused the division in the body of Christ was chosen by Paul as the historical setting for presenting Jesus Christ's declaration and institution of the Lord's Supper for a church worship. Now, as in this in this particular setting, we have then the uh, what's in the minds of the people and the activities of the partaker. It is described there, and so we want to uh, understand that we are needing to not only read the eleventh chapter when we're uh, setting the Lord's Supper and how we would enter into that. But we also want to understand uh, then the um, the information in the 10th chapter. Now, one principle for reading a letter is that we see the end of the document at the beginning. Therefore, we study the full content so that we can understand the main purpose for the letter being written. Uh, we, of course, uh, not only want to understand about the Lord's Supper and other uh, doctrines, but we want to learn to read the Bible for ourselves. And so uh, that is why I want to bring in the principles of biblical interpretation. And so to get an idea of the overall understanding of the many issues that come up in the Corinthian letter, uh, we want to understand the problem that was there in that. The Corinthian church members were dividing around certain teachers. Paul was one of those teachers. Apollos, Cephas, Christ. But he is saying then, listen to the message. Listen to the message. And so and many times then we have those who cause a division by following the man, simply listen to the man, not doing our own study. So although there are several topics were commented upon by Paul in the Corinthian letters, his aim was to help the church correct what he had heard from Coley's house, that there is contentions, Greek word is eris, uh, that is rivalry, wrangling among you. Rivalry would cause divisions. Uh, schisms is the Greek word that we're talking about. And that particular word means uh, to skid. That's basically what it means. And so, therefore, there was a sliding away from the church uh, in Corinth from what Paul had been there. He was there a year and a half then uh, in uh, First Corinth in the Acts, the 18th chapter. And he, uh, they were sliding away from that when he left. There was a this a, 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 this falling away this wrangling that was going on would cause divisions. And so we want to see Paul's definition then of a church. And all of this, then there was a sliding away from this idea. 
For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of one bread. He is particularly talking about now this communion in the Lord's Supper. He used that in the 10th chapter, verse 17. Now, at the Paul, time Paul wrote then, the division that was causing some members to slide away from the communion in the Lord's Supper was a faction. It had started there by someone, and he goes on to say, then there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. These factions then are developed. They developed in religion uh, groups. And sometimes then people began to listen to the man or the woman, whoever is leading that, a strong leader. And that was a problem in the Corinthian church. There's nothing wrong with the Paul or Cephas and so forth. But the, still the idea, don't follow the man, follow the gospel priest. Paul preached the kingdom of God, kingdom of Christ, and the priesthood of Jesus Christ for a year and a half in Corinth. But they were sliding away from that. We have identified then the historical setting for our literary analysis of 1 Corinthians 11, 17-34. Uh, we, doing exegesis, we go to the then and there, we get the historical setting. We're not to, uh, particularly here now talking about what they're saying to us, but what he said to the original audience. God speaks it to us, Christ speaks to us in literature. And so we then get the correct historical setup. We can easily read the literature. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians 11, 23-24. The word remembrance is a key word here that we need to understand. It has been translated from the Greek word A-N-A-M-N-E-S-I-S. -E My Greek's not well enough to pronounce that. According to Vine's Greek dictionary, this word contains two words, ana, and it means up, calling up. Uh, the last meaning, uh, the last part meaning to remind oneself of. So here we are at the worship service. Maybe it's a Sunday morning. Maybe the first, it must be the first day of the week, should be the first day of the week. That's our example in the Bible from Acts 20 and 7. Uh, the church met on the first day of the week. They broke bread. So what we are wanting to understand as we're doing that, then Jesus is saying, do this in remembrance of me. Now, he not only simply said, now, when you're taking that bread and that uh, uh, fruit of the vine, and when you're into that worship, don't just remember me. That's not what the word means. It means then that up, bringing up into your mind, into the reality, and taking the bread, and this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So there is an awakening in one's mind of Jesus Christ actually nailed to the cross. A communion happens when the partaker of the bread calls to their mind and heart Jesus Christ suffering on the cross for what? His or her sins. Consequently, remembrance is the proper preparation for a partaker's mind and heart for her or his communion of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 6, uh, 16. So looking back and forth in the 10th chapter was Paul there was trying hard to get the church to understand what was going on by some members still taking of that feast 
and it was still in their mind somewhat to that idol. And so he used that and used different ways for them to understand that uh, about the problem of, of being an idolater. But in that, he also used the Lord's Supper. He also used some uh, about the worship at the temple, at the uh, Jewish temple earlier. While breaking the bread, then, there is an affectionate calling forth of the terrible thing that happened. Jesus Christ nailed to a cross made of a tree. Peter put it like this, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Communion. In the same manner, he took also took the cup after supper, saying, now, this was later in that, uh, at that time, uh, he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, again, in remembrance of me, calling forth, what is this? What is this? It's running from the very body of Jesus Christ, who was not a sinner. Again, Jesus said, do this do as often as you drink it. Remember to me, Jesus' use of the word remembrance again in relation to the cup. It means much more than simply remembering that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for our sins. It's not just, yes, I remember that. Paul helped us to understand what Jesus meant by in remembrance of me in relation to this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, the old covenant we read about in the eighth chapter of Hebrews, um, but this new cup, this new cup that God would write his laws on the heart and mind and we'll be God's children and he'll remember our sins no more. And all of that then in this new covenant often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul helped us understand that then. Uh, the cup of blessing which we bless. The Greek word here is where you get the word eulogy, meaning to speak well. That's what it means. Is it not then, he says in 1016, the cup of blessing which we bless. I'm, quoting, I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 1016. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So again, I am saying that we need to very well understand chapter 10, which brings in, and without any question, we can understand the communion aspect of the Lord's Supper. He then defined the word communion by this illustration. Observe Israel after the flesh are not those who eat of the sacrifice partakers of the altar. He tries to make that point. The uh, Jewish temple was still there being maintained. That was still happening. The Jewish members who had been converted, they would be in the church. Uh, the, of course, uh, the Levi, the um, Israelites that were not Jews, uh, they would be uh, not understanding perhaps those, but Paul certainly was being a, a person, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Communion then has been translated from the word, word this Greek word here, K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A, meaning common. Just that's it. It means common. Well, that's a simple word to us in everyday language, but when we go to the New Testament, that word is understood in almost every aspect of the church. So for uh, several uses, to understand several uses of the word in different contexts of the word communion, and you can see the book, The Letter to the Corinthians, The Lord's Supper, Part 4, Lesson 5. It can be found on my website in English and in Telugu www.kingdomofchrist.info. Uh, 
uh, we, we don't want to take away from here. We are learning to read 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. So now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples come together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them. We're talking about now as Paul was traveling through Acts, uh, he is coming on his way back to um, Jerusalem, uh, and uh, he stopped over. And on the seventh day, they were taking the Lord's Supper. They called it the breaking of the bread or the Lord's Supper. This was a divine doctrinal worship of the church from the beginning of the time God offered mankind a new covenant in Jesus' blood. We can see then in Acts 2.42, after the 3,000 then was uh, converted, uh, once they heard about and understood they had killed the Messiah, the word was, uh, what shall we do? Repent, be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They then, in the breaking of the bread, or the Lord's Supper, uh, there was an appreciation of the priesthood of Jesus with the new covenant in Jesus' blood. It is a remembrance of partakers of the cup, or the fruit of the vine. We can see these different terminologies in different places. Matthew 26, 29, we understand the fruit of the vine, uh, and Luke 22, 18. So many other things are bringing in, but uh, my main, main purpose in making YouTube presentations is that certainly we appreciate those who are teaching the gospel, but we then must learn to read the scriptures for ourselves because they were not set there for us to follow. It is the words of the Bible that is, is to be heard. Therefore, an appreciation of the priesthood of Jesus Christ with the new covenant in Jesus' blood, uh, this is a remembrance of partakers of the cup or the fruit of the vine. The church, then the body of Christ, with Jesus as the head, are continually in a state of communion with Jesus as our Prince and Savior, our king and high priest, these are different terminologies for the same uh, service. We can read that in these scriptures set forth. We also uh, continuously enjoy a commune with God our Father by the presence of his Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians 13, 14. We have then a communion uh, with the Holy Spirit in that way. So, but in the Lord's Supper, it involves then as we would not partake of the Lord's Supper as a ritual or as a habit or as just something. It is a communion. Students of Hebrews and Romans appreciate the new, new covenant in Jesus Christ's blood. So as he has called forth that, if we do not know then about the new covenant from Hebrews 8, 10 through 12, in fact, all of the Hebrew uh, letter we need to understand, uh, then we would also uh, appreciate Romans 3, 21 to 26, where uh, in this new way of righteousness that we have then uh, the propitiation uh, toward propitiation propitiatory sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so we have then the blood, the new covenant in his blood. Several of those things that we don't want to take away from just the context here. The main thing is to help uh, Christians, uh, new Christians, uh, Christians who are wanting to uh, stand on their own feet, have their own faith, that they can read these scriptures for themselves. Paul began to close with the exhortation in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29. But we first then do our exegetical work of literary analysis of these scriptures in the historical context of 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 22. So let's get what I'm trying to say to you. Uh, Paul now is closing. Uh, he has set forth what Jesus set for, 
and he has helped us from the 10th chapter to understand what is a communion. And now he is doing some exhortations. He's doing that in this idea here of our exegetical work, understanding then the historical setting for him presenting 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 22, and this is what it is. Paul is saying, now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. Now this, within that is the Lord's Supper. That's, that's a terrible thing to say that a meeting where they are supposedly taking the Lord's Supper is for the worse rather than the better. For first of all, when they will come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it, for there must also be factions among you, that you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. And this is how factions or sects start. They are somebody wanting to be the leader, and he wants to be recognized in something. And Paul said, I guess this has to happen here. It explains what's going on and because of this terrible thing that you're doing and taking the Lord's Supper. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. When it comes to what we say about the church and what is this and that concerning the church, it's always what the Lord said, not what we say. And so they're saying it's the Lord's Supper. Paul is saying it's not the Lord's Supper. For in eating, one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have uh, uh, nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? And yes, I do not praise you. So this is the context then that he then quoted Jesus and Jesus presenting what happened in the Lord's Supper, Jesus simply saying, uh, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. Bring up, get the scene in your mind. This is a real happening. You must have a communion within it. You must be in that appreciation of what is coming. In the same way, he also took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do. And do it in remembrance of me, not just remember me. We must em emphasize that. So this is the context in which that was given. We then, as Christians, reading this, we want to make sure we get set up in the historical context. The technical word for that is doing our exegetical work. Exegesis simply means to go there and search out what that situation was. In that, we do the historical setup, and then we do our literary analysis. In other words, we want to hear what is said in that context. Uh, and so we will hear then, as Paul uh, goes toward the closing of this, how to uh, hear him in the proper way. Once we have a clear mental picture of what was happening in Corinth from the foregoing text, the one we just read, we can easily understand the following instructions and exhortations. As we said, exegesis uh, means a Bible student searches out the original situation. Once we attain a clear historical view of what was happening, we can easily understand what Paul said in the following scriptures. Carefully studying the sentences in this thought is what is called literary analysis. God speaks to us in literature. We must learn to read that literature, but he generally always, almost always, there is a historical setting from the Old Testament all the way through, or God speaking to us in literature. 
Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of Christ. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 11, 27-29. So, this is then that we are down to reading this, but this was what was said to them. The word hermeneutics is about how we learn from literature for the here and now. So once we have understood exactly what was said to that historical setting, we're in a better way. We have a control system for our own understanding of what he's saying for us. So simply, we are going to say here in closing this, uh, uh, if there is an unworthy manner for taking of the Lord's Sabbath, then there is a, if there's an unworthy manner, then there must be a worthy manner. So Paul used Jesus Christ's original words to instruct the church about how to partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. We read that a while ago and am quoting Jesus. Now, the Apostle Paul helped us to understand what Jesus meant when he said, in remembrance of me. We, we must get that meaning. It's more than just to remember Jesus, but we bring it up. We bring up the scene. We see ourselves in it. We have the capability to examine ourselves. That's what he said. Let a man examine himself. So let him eat uh, of the bread and drink of the cup in a worthy manner. Paul closed out the uh, Corinthian, the second Corinthian letter with this. Examine yourself as to whether you're in the faith. Of course, to bring up that scene means we must have faith in it. What Jesus is telling us, what he told the apostles, what we have quoted in many cases throughout the Gospels. So examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. So what do we do the next time we're taking we're about to take the Lord's Supper? Let's make sure that we break that bread with the right remembrance. This is my body. It's broken, suffering. It's on the cross, terrible death. And do it then. Remember me that way, in a communion way. Get there with me. Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? Well, this is a regular, this is it. He's the head, we're the body. That's what a church is. Unless indeed, you're disqualified. We are learners. We can improve ourselves in all ways by first of all learning what is there for us and then we bring it into our lives. The Corinthians was chosen. They had many, many, many problems. Uh, perhaps that was exactly why he, uh, when God had Jesus through the apostles, Paul, bring that forth. Most of those problems we would have, at least some of them, hopefully not all of them. Thank you.